This is Dentist Money. Now, here's your host, Reese Harper. Welcome to the Dentist Money Show, where we help dentists make smart financial decisions. I'm your host, Reese Harper, here with my trusty old co-host, Sir Ryan Isaac. Back again. Here we are. It's always a pleasure, uh, sir, to get you in the studio. Yep. I have to pull you away from your, your day where the fans are raving, trying to take your time, and we just get you for this moment. It's, uh, it's a truth rare moment. revealed. Yeah. We just wing it for an hour and see what happens. What comes up I wish this? it were winging it. This is the uh, latter part of nine hours of preparation for this particular episode. Yeah. So winging it may be, that might be winging it for you. <laughs> for some of us, that's the better part of our life. That's mostly what happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, uh, we, we have some interesting, st- we have an interesting story today. I like it, but that's because I enjoy Indiana Jones. Oh, you know it. Oh, yeah. Okay. He doesn't like that, though. For those of you who do not get that subtle reference, we are talking about. He doesn't like two things. Uh, he hates rats, but he really hates snakes. Snakes what are his he worst hate more? fear. Does he hate snakes or rats more? Snakes. It's not snakes. rats. I actually, watching Indiana Jones over the years, I don't recall rats being No, a, he's in that a tunnel underneath and the rest are pouring out of the walls and he's like, rats, I hate rats, but maybe I think that's an snakes. isolated scene in the, in the sequence. He mostly hates snakes. Snakes are kind of his mortal fear. Well, we're going to start the show talking about snake venom. Well, let's real quick, just okay. for viewers um, who want to compare Ryan Isaac to Indiana Jones. Yeah, let's do that. Which is a common- <laughs> Seems normal. I think that's a common it's thing totally, that happens. Totally normal. I would say if Indiana Jones' fear is snakes, yeah, your fear rhymes with snakes is earthquakes. Earthquakes, really <laughs> rhymes with snakes. You have a lot of fears, so I, I just wonder which fears. one you'd say. I didn't want to. I'm not leading you here. Top five earthquakes are in there. Second, uh, being late for an air, airplane. Third, inconveniencing strangers in public. Fourth, car accidents. Normal car accidents. I don't know what's abnormal. Uh, what's the most fearful car accident you could think of? I mean, I know you're you're leading me towards auto pedestrian. <laughs> <laughs> That's his worst fear. He has an auto pedestrian fear. Ooh. It happens. Is there a fifth you can think of? No, that that's that's it. You that, only have four fears. Yeah, the top four. Those I'm going to give you four. a fifth fear. Okay. You, what is it? Me driving you places. Hmm. It's been we've done it enough. <laughs> We've done it enough. Your fear is me being the map while you drive. You giving me driving directions is my first fear. I cannot fear. read, and it's not even reading a map. It's holding a phone while it talks to you, and I still can't do it right. Segway snakes. <clears throat> How much of that and will remain? We'll see. Indiana Jones is uh, fearful of snakes. Ryan is fearful of five things equivalent <laughs> to snakes. <laughs> I am. Leading it's us so to true. this episode today. Fearful. And we're not going to tell you what it's about yet, but we will tell you it's about snakes. Well, okay. Well, we're going to start by talking about snake venom in, in particular. What comes to mind when, when you think, when you hear those words, snake venom? My childhood. <laughs> Actually, that's um, true, isn't it? Killing a baby rattlesnake. You were just telling the story. That's not a joke. Um, having a shovel with a bent tip and trying to kill a baby rattlesnake, but it getting wedged between the shovel and a cement wall. Uh huh. Attacking me. Yeah. Me fighting it off. Yeah. Um, fears of my childhood. And because this is an Idaho farm, that's a normal thing that a parent's just like, eh, let them deal with it. Yeah. Basically. Well, I put my dog on it. <laughs> he fought it off. What was the name of the dog? Do you remember? Uh, that was uh, the era of Jacques. <laughs> He's a miniature <laughs> schnauzer. Full grown though. Uh, never groomed. <laughs> and left to run in the wild. And uh, he became a man. He he became a man. Uh, On the potato the brush. farm. All right. Uh, born <laughs> from Scott, born from Scotland, raised Idaho bred. You think about trapping a snake b- between a shovel and a house and the uh, the schnauzer named jo- Jacques. Mm-hmm. Some people think of uh, snake venom. They think of pain and death and bites and fear. Some of us think of pets. <laughs> Amputations. Friends. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, not everyone. The term <laughs> snake venom usually it just it produces a lot of negative thoughts and emotions yeah. for justified. I see that's fair. Very fair, very justified because it can do a lot of harm to people. But a lot of our listeners may not know that snake venom is not always bad news. Really? I'm here to tell you. Snake venom is not always bad news. I found an article 
on a website called Engineers Journal. So very official. Okay, it's the Engineers Journal. Yeah, if, it, if it's not official because it's an Engineers Journal, then it I says don't know journal. what if, journal. If might. it was like Engineers Blog, no, Engineers no. Journal. Yeah, very official. It says the venom of poisonous animals contains toxic proteins that attack the nervous system, the heart, and blood cells and blood circulation to kill prey. That's how it works. However. In small quantities, the same proteins that usually kill can relieve disease symptoms in humans and save lives. Really? So yeah. snake bites are not altogether bad. So, so Indiana Jones, if he just would have let the snakes bite a him, little bit. he could have been healed from those mortal wounds. Two stories in our office this week. Uh, someone here has a family member whose grandpa or uncle built up a tolerance over his entire lifetime to snake bites. Why? Was I don't he know. Testing that? I, it was one of the associate advisors. Yes. Okay. He would actually do that because they lived in a, a snaky region. All right. That's real. Story two this week, though, we were talking about this. And Q has a friend who is a doctor. So also very official. Yeah. Shout out to Dr. Larson. <clears throat> Dr. Larson. Is that the love doctor or what doctor was that? <laughs> the love doctor. That was my... Because uh, that that's what, not I, an actual MD, Q. Yeah, it was a physician. That doctor you talked to. <laughs> yeah. And I know that there is that doctor, <laughs> but this was a different one. <laughs> the physician you talked to, the love doctor. <laughs> it's important to make that distinction. Yeah. That is a trademark name, but it is not an actual credential. 10-4. Uh, he called his other doctor friend. Who was recently, funny enough, he was attending a snake venom or snake bite conference, right? Snake bite conference? Yeah. Uh, and he was telling Q about the process of making anti-venom to treat snake bites. It's pretty fascinating. So it turns out there's two snake farms in in the United States. There's one here in Utah where they, they get venom. They extract venom from the Western Diamondback and the Mojave rattlesnake, your favorite. That's the Mojave rattlesnake, Mojave. Right? And then they have, uh, in Florida, they do the same thing with the Eastern Diamondback and the Cottonmouth. So what? here's the process. They take the venom from the snakes in these two farms, and then they send the venom to whales, not the animal, to the place, whales. And in whales, they pull certain proteins out of the venom, that, and it's the proteins that... Uh, the, it liquefies the tissue and attacks your uh, central nervous system. So they take these proteins out, they combine the proteins from the venom of all four snakes and make it into like this snake venom cocktail. It's very... Not for drinking, but... Don't drink it. It is a concoction. Maybe that'd be a better word. Shaken, not stirred. And then, so then they take this cocktail of snake venom proteins, they send it from Wales to Australia, and then they inject it into sheep. From there, the sheep in their bodies, they create these anti antibodies to um, fight the toxins that they injected in there. Then they extract the antibodies, uh, antibodies from the sheep and then send those back to whales. And then from there, they create anti-venom. And then the anti-venom is called crofab. Okay. FYI. Then they can send the anti- Which makes sense since it came from sheep, not crows. <laughs> not crows. Or... But okay. what's cool is then they can take that that um, anti venom and then they send it back to the states where it's used to treat snake bites and not just not just those four snakes but those four snakes the venom contributes to anti venom that can uh, be the cure or, or the remedy for any kind of snake bite. Interesting in North America. In North America, is what I was told. That's yeah. yeah, in North America. So shout out to uh, the love doctor that gave us the snake bite information. We Jeez. appreciate it. But so as I mentioned, this article. Also talked about how scientists are discovering ways that snake venom can be used to treat things like heart disease and cancer, diabetes. Popular Science had a similar article. They use it to reduce blood pressure, uh, treat central nervous system disorders, make brain cells light up for bra better brain scanning. It's kind of crazy. The point is, here's what we're getting at. There's things we often attribute to being bad or, you know, evil or painful or just bad, like venom, okay? But like we said, most people... You know, they, they probably associate snake venom with pain and, and something bad for a good reason. But it also can be used for good. And that's what we're talking about today. It just depends how you use it and in what amounts. So today, perfect segue, just like snake venom, we're going to talk about how dentists, a lot of dentists have negative thoughts about debt, right? Yeah. Kind of the same uh, painful amputation reaction as, as as snake bites, snake venom. They want to get rid of it as soon as possible, sometimes at all costs. But if it's used in the right doses, debt can be a, a really positive part of a financial plan. It can help you build your business and your wealth faster than you'd be able to without it. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how using debt in the right amounts can actually be a positive thing. Before we say anything, let's say this. Um, 
It's awesome to be debt free. And all of you out there, shout out to all of you people that are debt free. Yeah. Love it. Uh, would it's love a great to, goal. Would love to be there at some point in our lives. Um, especially, uh, I think both of us on this podcast would love to be there. Be Neither fantastic. one of us is at that point. I think it's important for you to know the context from which we're coming from. We are not debt free young uh, financial advisors at the healthy age in our mid 30s. Yep. Um, many late. of you are going to be uh, carrying a little bit of debt for a while. Most of you's, uh, most of your student loans yeah. are larger than most people's mortgages on their homes. Yeah. So there's just a, there's a, a there's a simple uh, reality to the life of a dentist that this is something you're going to have to get comfortable with. If you're making, uh, the way we, we look at people's uh, income, there's only a certain amount of your income every year you even have the option to do something with. Uh, and some of that gets taken uh into standard living expenses, taxes take away about 25 to 35 percent or more. Uh, your spending can be about your living that. expense. You, some of you need to eat. Um, some of you need homes. Kids cost a lot of you, money. You have basic living expenses. There's probably not like even for the most frugal people out there of your the income you earn every year, you probably only have the option of 30 to 40 percent of it to do something with. And so the re, just the real the raw math is is pretty daunting if you were to take all of your discretionary income and just throw it all towards debt. Uh, for most people, it's still going to be, um, it's going to be, multi, you know, 10 plus years to 15 plus years to get out of debt unless you're kind of an ex a, a much higher income earner. Yeah. So th I don't know that the idea though, that get comfortable with debt is kind of been something that's been hard for me. I don't know if you can relate to that too, but it's just, seems like every time you take on debt, especially if you take on new debt or more so debt painful. than you've had yeah. to kind of grow your practice or expand it, um, there's this feeling of like... What did I do? Defeat, I think. Yeah. Of like, like I went oh backwards. my gosh, I just went backwards, right? Yeah. And that's kind of... I think that's normal. Yeah, it's normal. I thought maybe we could start by talking about, you know, what, what are the... Like, how do businesses grow? Because kind of the first point we want to make is it is normal. Like you said, you know, there's three ways businesses can grow or start and grow. You can, uh, bootstrap it, which means you just take the cash flows from the business and pay for the stuff that you got to pay for to grow. That's what that means. <clears throat> bootstrap. I thought bootstrap was actually taking the straps off of your boots. And, I wonder what the story is behind that actually. It's both. It's both. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. I've heard it yeah. both ways. <laughs> It's both. I've heard it both ways. So, so you you're can both, bootstrap you're both it. both right, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the second way you can do it? You can raise money. So you can sell off pieces of your business, like a stock. So you can sell capital. it to an associate. You could sell it to a partner. Mm -hmm. You can sell it to uh, an, a group of investors or individuals. You can sell stock in your small business uh, and get the the value of the equity. Yeah. Uh, and give away a percentage of your company. Why don't you talk about that for a second? Because we've been talking about that lately. Um, in investments in private business and, and things like that. What What's the difference between a tech company who's building some software who can go raise some money from different partners and, you know, a one location, six operatory dental practice raising money from partners? Like, why is it different for the tech company and, and the dental practice? Well, the... There, there's a term in business called cost of customer acquisition. And the more uh, expensive it is to acquire customers, the, the harder it is to acquire customers, the more money it takes. Mm. And so businesses that have a really small cost of customer acquisition can bootstrap and grow for quite a while and get to the point to where they may not need um, large amounts of money. Uh, there's also a difference between a service and a product. Yeah. And I think that's probably the main difference and why a dental practice can't. Yeah. The, both raise of money these, away. They're, they're both relevant. If you think about how much it costs to buy a customer in dentistry, I mean, it's, it's not going to be for, for most dentists. You could, you could spend between 50 and, you know, a hundred dollars and probably buy a customer, buy a, an appointment, buy a visit. Mm -hmm. I mean, all you have to do is give away a free, uh, comprehensive exam. Yeah. And they would show Some up whitening. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, so you can get a, you can invest a hundred to 150 to $200 and you're going to get a customer. And then you get in the future, they're going to have all of these visits that they'll pay you for. And it's worth investing a little bit of money. What businesses often look at is they look at a break even point and they say, how much money would I have to 
uh, spend to uh, get to the point where I can buy the target amount of customers I want. So in a dental practice, if I want to get to 2,000 customers, then I just have to spend a certain amount of money to get that. And if I want 2,000 customers and each of them costs 100 bucks, then all I'm going to be spending is $200,000. So if I had $200,000 to just throw at marketing one day, I could probably buy a whole practice, a whole practice worth yeah. of patients. If yeah. I could get that money to be used efficiently, and when you when you say, "Well, that's the limit of what I want to get to," mm-hmm. and all it's going to take is two hundred thousand dollars to do that, then an investor is going to say, "Well, that, that's not really an investable amount of money. You're not yeah. going to want to give away. You're just going to go to the bank and get a loan for that two hundred and put it towards marketing and build your own business. You can keep all of the equity." Yeah, and because um, there's not an incentive for someone to be like an outside equity partner in, in, in one location. Right. So sometimes you'll see, you know, dental practices, uh, that's kind of the value of having a large corporate chain is being able to bundle a lot of people together and you could spend more than that $200,000 to buy lots of patients for lots of practices. And in some cases yeah. that can make sense, but services like dentistry, just they, they, they definitely have different uh, motivations, different economics for investors than a product like software. You can't just like build it really fast and um, buy customers like overnight because a lot of these customers are, are making choices between uh, a lot of dentists in their local community that they may or may want to, they might want to go to someone else and not you. And, mm-hmm. and I just think it's important for dentists to realize that, you, you know, there's two ways you can go with, uh, you know, getting started and, and you can borrow money to get started yep. or you can sell stock to get started. But most dentists aren't going to have the motivation to sell equity because they're giving away too big of a piece of their company. And the upside for an investor, I mean, if you're talking about someone with one location and maybe one producer in the practice, I mean, what's the upside for the investor anyway? Yeah. Compared well, to raising well, the, money in you other know, businesses. They, well, the, it'd be great if if they could get a dentist convinced to do it because you could get half the profits for the rest of your life, and you know it's just a, so. Who's the dentist that would give that up? Right? Who's the dentist that would give that up? Versus the other, the the third way, which most dentists uh, use to grow their business is by uh, through debt. Yeah, and so you know, I think the thing to remember though about debt that kind of makes it useful is when companies are starting out like companies dot would be dot they would love to have the opportunity that dentists have to borrow as much money as dentists can borrow yeah. to start because by being willing to pay the bank that six to eight percent or you know that five to seven percent interest every year you're able to start something that goes from zero uh to you know it's full capacity, right? You can go from zero. If you're doing a startup, you can go from zero to millions in collections within a few short years. And all you had to do is pay seven to nine percent interest to go and get that all to build a full business. Yeah. And if you had to sell equity to do that, I mean, you you you'd give up so, the the rate of return. Think about the rate of return to go from zero uh, dollars to a, a million plus in value overnight. Yeah, you know, in, in a few short years, it's it's a the, those first few years of starting a dental practice. That's where all the return is earned. It's those first few years, and then after that, it's a nice return if you're working there. I mean, it's it's a fifteen to twenty plus percent annual return on the value of the business. But getting it started and going from zero to that point where it's full, there's a lot of return that happens in those first few years, and 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 so I guess the the point is if you can just if you can think about how much more expensive it would be if when you got done with building that, you weren't able to get debt, you had to sell stock to a partner, or you had to sell yeah. equity to someone like most businesses have to. And you get to that point where it's at capacity and you've given away half of your profits. So your return is, you know, instead of being a 20 percent return, because that's the reason I said that number is a lot of dentists, you know, after they pay themselves normally, they might have 15 or 20 percent profit. Right. Imagine if you had to give half of that away because you had to raise through equity or another medium um, up front. You know, it, it would be so you would give away this like 30 year stream of yeah. half of your profits. And so debt's something, though, that like it seems expensive because you're paying 7 percent, 8 percent you know, 5%, 9%. But the equity that you own in that practice, if you own all of it, I mean, it's paying you 20% a year just to have, just to hold on to it. 
Um, the and equity it, is, yeah, which yeah, is why it's not worth selling. Yeah, and it, it's just, it's really a good deal. Like even if you've financed your practice your whole life and you never ended up paying off your debt, you're, you're paying for something. You're paying 7% to own something that's making you 15 to 20 every year if you're willing to just work in it, or even if you hired an associate and you just kept holding it. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good thing that financing like in the dental industry exists like it does. It's not, it's not a common, it's not a common thing for any industry. Yeah. And so I don't, I think sometimes dentists probably don't think about utilizing debt properly. They think about it in terms of one loan and that one loan getting paid off. Yeah, when it's done. And when that loan's over. paid off, then I'm done with my debt. Or, I, and I get a new loan, that means I have to re you know, I don't want to have new debt. Yeah. Now, to some, you can see the problem of thinking that way. The problem of thinking that way is that, that, that bi- most businesses, the way they operate, these, you know, a, a public company especially, they look at a percentage of their balance sheet uh, and say that, if my business is worth, let's say a million dollars, like a they'll take a dental, dental practice worth a million dollars. They say, I'm going to always have some of my uh, business um, leveraged and some yeah. of it not. So I've right. got maybe equity of 700 and debt of Three, 300. Yeah. And the way a public company is valued is by that debt to equity ratio is a, or the you know equity to total value. They call it book to market. There's a lot of different ways to look at the value of a company, but there's always some mix of debt and equity that when you add those together, that's how you get to the total value of the company. Um, the equity plus the debt is the total uh, value. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, or the total value minus the debt is the equity, right? Yep. That's the the math. And so if you, if you, if you think about your business more in terms of, look, at, if my business is kicking off this percentage return every year and I'm not, I, the whole thing isn't leveraged. I mean, if you had a million dollar practice and a million dollars, a million dollar practice should be kicking off about 200,000 in profit if you're a GP. If not you're, including the production. Not including what you make. You should be yeah. making 30 plus percent as a producer, right? Yeah. 25 to 30 plus as the producer or an associate should be making that and you should be capturing 15 to 20, 20 plus depending on the market you're in. Now, if you're a specialist, those ranges are going to vary slightly. So ortho is a little bit different, and, and ortho and OS and pedo might be slightly, uh, and, and endo probably have slightly better profit margins and a little bit higher producer costs. And and so if you if you look at that, you can go, okay, if the whole million dollar practice had 100% of it was debt, and I'm paying 8% on that, yeah. you know, whole thing, it's yeah. 80 grand a year in interest, and I had to I had to buy it. And I had to pay an interest only loan for Forever. 50 years to kick off your 15 to 20 percent to kick off that 20, you know, 15, even if it's 15 percent. Yeah. So if it's kicking off 15 percent for you to own it and you never pay the debt off, you're making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in profit and you're paying 80 grand a year in mm-hmm. interest payments. Yeah. What's wrong with that investment? That's a great investment. Yeah. There's not like most people looking at uh, a business. Those are good returns. Those would be good returns. Yeah. You just all you have to do is sign up for this debt and you and you are you get the return. You get the return on yeah. that, which is going to be healthy for you. There's also what's called a tax shield that these public companies look at. And they look at the eighty thousand dollars in debt in my example that they're going to be paying and saying, well it really isn't costing me eighty because I'm paying taxes and my that interest gets written off from my taxes. So the tax shield is yeah. like you take 30% off or 35% yeah. off. So you're probably really only paying like 55 grand 55,000 to get 150. To get a 150. So you've got 100,000 a year or a 10% return just because the debt was there. Yeah. Which person's in a stronger financial position? Mm-hmm. The person who has their million dollars sitting in, a, in an account liquidity. invested, it's liquid, or the person who paid the practice off with cash and is got no liquidity but they have a little bit higher fixed income coming in every year. Mm-hmm. Well, if that practice declines and the practice blows up or the practice doesn't do as much in collections or the they bear the full mails, liability of it, you bear yeah. the full risk. So the reason co- companies use debt is it protects their liquidity. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It protects their 
uh, liability risk because it allows the business to bear some of the financial risk of going down and yeah. breaking. Uh, and and a lot of companies will will use debt for those two reasons. They also use it for that interest and tax shield that we talked about because by borrowing money and writing that interest off, it, it improves the rate of return you're going to get mm-hmm. on the practice that you own. These are really simple, simple like finance lessons, but I, I don't think they're understood that well by most they aren't, of us. You know, it's, it, what's interesting, another thing that dentists, um, this makes me think about, a lot of dentists are involved in real estate and most dentists go get loans for their real estate. I mean, just the math of it on paper, uh, levered real estate returns are um, a lot better than paying cash for your real estate. Yeah. You know, the, the returns of it, mathematically. And people... Um, see that pretty easily. Like yeah. that's a pretty easy example. Like, yeah, of course I'll, I'll get my down payment, but then the rest of it, the bank's going to finance and you know, we'll, we'll rent it out or whatever you're going to do with the real estate. But dental practices are viewed differently that way. Yeah. Like it's like a, a burden or a mistake or it shouldn't have happened. And yeah, you know, got to get rid of this. I have this huge yeah. debt. Well, think about like, which one are they most likely to pay off quickest? Which one are you most likely to pay off faster? Between a building and a, a practice? Yeah. The practice. It's usually the highest interest rate, and it, it's almost always the practice, Yeah, right? It's, a le- it's and, the least tangible thing, which is yeah. funny. But truthfully, that's the one where there's the highest um, the highest rate of return. The highest spread. Is occurring in that practice. Yeah. Now, I'm, just, I'm speaking specifically right now to people who want to or want to aspire to own more than one practice or expand to multiple locations. Okay. If you want to own one practice and you want to keep it simple and just dial things in and not have the stress, I totally like understand that. Ryan understands that. I mean, it's a, there's a big lifestyle choice difference that you're making when you say, I'm going to have a few locations or Mm -hmm. whatever instead of one. But if you're trying to get to the point where if you have this investment, this practice you could buy, and you could earn 15 or 20% return on it on the cash that you, you know, that you outlay or borrow to buy. I mean, the the spread between the seven to eight percent interest you're gonna pay on the loan, that's high, by the way, right yeah, now. Yeah, today's rates aren't it's like, like maybe that. sixes. Well, in practice rates, we're like fours and fives. I'm trying to yeah. like present the worst case scenario here on the practice just like, debt. Yeah, oh seven rates. <laughs> yeah. So let's say it's six percent interest on a yeah. million dollar practice yeah. today. I mean you're you're making three times the amount of return than you are paying in interest to buy it. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're at fifteen or twenty percent profit, it's yeah. and, and maybe that's the key. Like some people are not running a fifteen to twenty percent profit. And yeah. We gotta acknowledge that. Some yeah. people are like All their profit is just their production. Yeah, they're making thirty percent on the whole practice, which yeah. is what they should get paid as a producer. Yeah. So there's just some, you know, f- overall there's some optimization that would have to occur for these numbers to pan out properly. I'm just trying to paint the picture of how, how important like debt can be mm-hmm. when you're trying to, um, how normal it is to, yeah. Have a, when you're trying to be aggressive as an entrepreneur and try to pursue some risk and take advantage of some opportunity, it's just not going to happen without mm-hmm. some financing. Yeah. And in industries where you can't get debt, you're going to see a lot of equity financing and in industries where you can get debt like dentistry, you should just take advantage of it and then figure out the right way to reduce it over time, the right way to sort of yeah, which we'll, back we'll out get of to it. That. But yeah. my point is, here's my just point. And I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pay off your debt. I'm just saying, even if you did not pay off the debt ever, and all you did was take the money and, and sell it later and, and build up your liquidity and build up your retirement plans and get more deductions through, um, building a you know a, a pension and putting your money towards retirement. If you had a fully leveraged practice, your whole career paying an interest rate that was, you know, th- that was market more market average. Yeah. Call it six to seven. Yeah. Seven and a half even, which is we're not even close to that at this point. Mm. Even if that were the case, I mean, it's still a very profitable very yeah. uh, difference. Yeah. And it and and sometimes paying that debt down doesn't actually make the practice make you any more money. Mm -hmm. It's not really, it's not a, if you're not taking advantage of all of your retirement plan contributions, if your income is higher than it should be, if you're wasting money on taxes, if you're not improving your practice uh, competitiveness, if you're not investing in marketing, if your space is dated, if you're losing patients, like you're, you're, 
paying off your debt at the expense of not doing those other things could actually be lowering your net worth, yeah. even though you think it might be. Yeah. Well, I think this is a really good point to bring up. We can kind of close out this part of it. But if if this if the return is great and th- this asset that you've built, you don't you don't want to make any decisions that will jeopardize that return. Yeah. You, you want to do everything you can to make sure that return stays as long as you're working and the and you've protected the value of this asset the whole time. Yes. And I mean, everyone knows the stories of the the older practices that the debt was paid off and nothing was reinvested. No cash and no debt was reinvested for the last 20 years of the thing, you know, and the inside is old and there's no technology and there's no marketing and patients have dropped and the value was not protected. The value of the asset is now has, has dropped significantly. Some people just will walk away from practices and yeah. then the income wasn't protected either. Yeah. You know, I just think that keeping those numbers in mind of like, huh, what is my return on my practice? Not what am I making off my own production, but what is the profit that I'm making off this practice? Is it 15? Is it 18? Is it 20? Because a lot of times what you'll see is people will pay down their debt and try to get rid of the debt, but it'll come at the expense of that margin going down. Mm -hmm. So a practice who always carries debt, but always is able to maintain a 20% profit margin is going to be in better shape. Like we were just looking today at our uh, profitability uh, metrics for general dentists. I was going to say we're just measuring this this month. There's... um, the the if you take all of like there there's a big spread between GPs alone there are there are people who are experiencing a twenty two to twenty five percent profit total profit. Uh, on top of their thirty yeah. percent of production that they're earning off their own production and then there are people who are earning a total between profit and production of like twenty five yeah I mean you've got a, a you have a massive difference which is like an, a low paid associate yes. Yeah. And there's just a huge difference between those those two practices and and what we what I often see is that people who are not willing to carry a little bit more debt and reinvest in their mm-hmm. practice, they they're not as competitive and their practices aren't as healthy and their technology's well, dated. You're not protecting that investment. You're not protecting that investment and you, so your return of that investment goes down. Mm-hmm. You used to be at a 15 to 18% profit margin, but now you're at like a 5 because you refuse to which is a really interesting way to look at it because what if you what if your 401k had a 15% return your whole career and now it's down to 5 yeah you know you you do something about that yes you know yeah practice is the kind but of your practice is by far your biggest investment but a lot of people don't treat it like the financial instrument that it is they're just happy they have a job and that it pays them well yeah but they don't look yeah. at it and say how much do I make from this practice versus how much I make as a producer? Mm -hmm. And is this return, is my return on this investment going down or up? Yeah. Has it been going down 15% a year for the last five years? Because you can go from 15% profit to 13 to 11 to nine. Mm -hmm. It's dropping 20% a year in terms of profit. Yep. And you're just kind of probably not even aware of that. Yeah but you've been paying off all your debt and your debt's going down. You're happy because I don't have any debt anymore yeah. and my practice debt's gone and I'm debt free. Yep. Well, the pra- your practice, unfortunately, the profitability has declined quite a bit and it's because you haven't been investing in marketing. You haven't been keeping up with th- your technology. Your building's starting to get dated. Yep. You're, you've had turnover in your front desk staff. No one's you know, scheduling appointments properly. No one's booking treatment. No one's making sure that, uh, you know, the, that anyway, that long story, I just feel like that is a really, it's a crucial subject to like be aware of and know that debt is not the bad guy. Debt is the thing that gives you the flexibility to protect that practice profit margin. And over time you, you will get rid of it. I mean, we're not saying like refinance every year and, and never, um, no, it'll go away. The debt's going to be going away, even if it's on the slowest reduction term yeah. possible. Yeah. It's just, at what expense are you accelerating your debt reduction? Or or at what expense are you willing to not have any more debt? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you need some new equipment and it's the last five years of the practice, get some new equipment. Yeah. Protect that value and that and that margin before you sell it. Well, and emotionally, I think it's important to acknowledge that emotionally, how do you think people carry debt differently? Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's the other point, too, is I mean, debt is such an emotional thing. It feels so tangible to to pay off debt. Even if someone pays off a low interest rate loan, it feels more ta- tangible than putting it in a retirement account that theoretically is supposed to get a higher return. Yeah. You know, even if it's triple the amount or something. Let's talk about this a little bit is debt 
do you think debt's really the biggest stress that people have when they are thinking about their finances and they feel stress and they want to fix something? They usually go to debt. Yeah. But is debt really the biggest stress? I don't think it is. It's definitely one of the biggest things on their mind. I mean, it's a, it's definitely one of the bigger pieces of their financial plan and the, you know, the overall, you know, kind of puzzle, but it I don't I don't think it's the biggest problem. I no. think it is the thing that people will blame it gets when they blamed the fir- that's the first thing people when will When they blame. feel like they're stressed with their money. Yeah. What 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 creates financial stress do you think? When someone says, "Man, I'm just stressed out. Uh, I'm my financial picture just doesn't seem as healthy as it, I'd like it to be." What is the usually the reason for that? I well, the first thing is I don't even think people know how to define that. There's a feeling behind that, you know, like I don't think I'm I'm not headed in, in the right place where I, I want to be, you know, or I don't think this is going where I think it should be. But I don't even think people can define that really. So I would say number one is not being organized, not having some quantifiable data on what are you worth? What is your net worth and how much does it grow every year that you go to work? You know, so I would say number one is organization, just having everything kind of laid out in front of you so you can admit what it is on paper with data quantifiably. I think that's step one. Step two, I think, is a lack of liquidity. I think if everyone had exactly the same amount of debt as they have today, but they were a lot more liquid, you know, many years worth of their spending liquid yeah. that they could get at. And it, it was organized. Like they knew where stuff was going. They knew when the money came in, you see a tax return. You said, I made 500 grand this year. I have no idea where the money went. Or I feel like all my money's going to taxes. If you actually knew those numbers and you had liquidity, I think those two things would completely get rid of that like anxious feeling of debt. Yeah. And it usually does. I mean, we've seen clients who are like, who who feel, get to that point and they want to make some drastic changes just to get rid of debt at all costs. And we encourage them to be balanced and give it some time. And it's interesting how just, you know, even a couple short years later, when they they have liquidity and they have savings and it's auto, it's automated and they they have a plan, they know where they're headed, they're tracking things, how the debt doesn't bother them anymore. Yeah. It's not even the issue. I think you're right. I think it for me, that's the the biggest source of financial anxiety that I have as a business owner is when I feel like I don't have the liquidity I want inside of my business or personally to feel really comfortable, like I can make the right investments mm-hmm. in my business. And I think that's where the the dentists get to is be, when they have plenty of liquidity, you can have conversations about, the importance of um, hiring the right team, you know, building the right team, yeah, and maybe o- investing a lot more than you have previously invested in to marketing, yeah, spend on marketing or to grow an office manager who has more experience, yeah, a treatment coordinator who's able to really book treatment and think about treatment, you know, effectively and how they're going to schedule that, and then if you don't have liquidity in the practice and you don't have liquidity personally. You could have a really high income, like your income could be super high, uh, but if you don't have like cash sitting there, like many months, and is in my case, in my personal experience, it's not months, it's years. Mm-hmm. If I have years worth of liquidity, where I'm like, you know what, if everything goes bad, I'm still going to be able to last for like four or five years. Yeah, that just changes so much, like your ability to invest in your business and yourself, and, and if you don't have that kind of liquidity. You're not able to take the same amount of risk in your practice. Okay. So one of the last things um, to talk about is, you know, how, how to deal with the debt at di- different phases of career. You know, someone who's at the end of the career will have a lot different option um, to do something with their debt than someone in the beginning, you know? So maybe we could talk about that for a minute. We get a lot of calls from people who are wondering, you know, maybe their first five years of their career. And they're kind of wondering, you know, I've got the practice and I've got a house and I'm starting to pay taxes and I've got these student loans and now a practice loan, maybe a building loan. How do I think about this? You know, what am I supposed to do? So maybe we could just break it up in phases for a minute and kind of give some maybe just some general um, recommendations for how people could think about their debt during these different phases. I would start with the beginning and by saying, and this is something we, we tell a lot of younger dentists that there's a lot of priorities in those early years that that need your time and your money and your resources, you know, a, ahead of paying off the student loan faster. Yeah. For example, it, you know, if the if the business is new, then learning how to be a good business owner, I mean, it's probably it's a skill set that probably never ends the learning curve. 
but learning as much as you can in those early years about running that business, you know, about your books and your accounting and managing people, you know, keeping up on your clinical skills in those early parts of your of your career. Getting your financial tracking down so you can actually know yeah. where you're ma- if you have profit versus if you're just making money as a producer, mm-hmm. kind of knowing your financials is really crucial. Yeah, those are the early years. A lot of people are buying their first homes during that period of life. Yeah. They're maybe going from the, the startup location of a few chairs and they, they want to move, they need to move, and they have maybe a goal of a down payment to save. It yeah. could include the house too, you know? Getting that liquidity built up we talked about, it's a big time to sort of say, okay, I want to get that year plus personal mm-hmm. living expenses saved up and I want that solid three to six months worth of overhead yeah. in my practice. Yep. And maybe even having, you know, beyond your house down payments and your remodel down payments or your future dream home down payments, like just make sure you've still got that year to two years worth of liquidity. It just, it really will change your, all of you are going to need to have liquidity in your career if you're going to be able to make a tough decision in your practice at some point. Like there, there's never a Not point forced into something. Yeah. There's, well, there's never a point is as a business owner, there's never a point when you're going to be a hundred percent comfortable with the amount of money that your practice is going to require to out of you. Like you're never going to be like, Oh, it's fine. It's just another $20,000. Yeah. There's always going to be this like demand that if you're going to grow it and protect it and keep it healthy, it's always going to be uncomfortable and you're going to have to keep feeding it. Um, money in order for it to stay competitive. That doesn't mean that you're going to, you should over invest in it, but it, it means that most of you are probably going to be hesitant to give it money that it really requires to keep it competitive. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't have that liquidity in those early years built up already, you just won't be able to be quite as, well, I don't want to say aggressive, but even like just we'll call it conservative. Being conservative as a practice owner means giving your business enough money to yeah. sort of protect it. Yeah. And if you don't have the liquidity, you just can't. So well, those first few years yeah. are all about liquidity. Super crucial. I mean, and that's a time when you're getting used to your new tax bill, yep. um, cash flow. I, I would just say, you know, take care of those priorities first. Make sure there's cash in the bank. Make sure there's personal liquidity that you're, you know, you're taking care of some of these big items. You're ahead of your taxes. I mean, we, we've talked to a lot of people who are in those first few years and every year is like a catch up tax bill, yeah. you know, uh, while the student loans got money, you know, the student loans got extra money, but then we were catching up on taxes. So th- those are just really crucial years to put the, f- the first priorities first. And, you know, even if you, if, even if you're not in a position to pay down debt faster during those years, those are good times to look for better refinances. You know, it's not evil to stretch your loans out. If yeah. you start out with like a seven year practice loan and it's choking you and you can't, you don't have anything left over, it's not the worst thing in the world to move it up to yeah. a 10 or a 15. It doesn't mean you have to wait that long to pay it off, but those early years, you need that cash flow to have some kind of wiggle room and to, to even start a foundation on anything. Yeah. Let's talk about phase two. Uh, we're getting into that, fi- you know, you're five years in, 10 years in. One more thing I'd add to phase one is I think people should have a basic automatic like draft for retirement in those Mm -hmm. early years to get used to what it feels like to invest money, be scared about watching your accounts go up and down, learn the fundamentals of how stocks and bonds work, how mutual funds work and ETFs work. What does it feel like to save money and have it go down while you still have debt and a a business that's leveraged in? Learn how like you're going to just go through the emotional experience of like- With like 10 grand before. I hate (laughs) investing and- (laughs) It all, my accounts never seem to give me returns. Yeah. Those are the emotions. Even if you have had a good, uh, the problem is you're going to, the way investing works, you're going to have like five great years and three bad years and four good ones. You'll never then, even, you won't, most of the time, not even recognize the good ones yeah. or remember them. So I just think the earlier you can get started in feeling the emotions around investing. Yeah. It's a it's healthy, probably the better. That's good. But emotionally. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it at the expense of carrying any credit card balances and I wouldn't do it at the sure. expense of having any really high interest rates on my, on my loans. If I could, if I pay my loans down 50,000 and I can refinance them, there's just some limits to that advice. But I, I think by the time you get to maybe year five and 10, five through 10 in that kind of range, things change a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So kind of the, the middle part of your career, you're starting to hit the peak earning years. Um, your loans. Most, pe- most people's peak earning happens about what age do you think when you, if you had to guess? Mid forties. Yeah, that's what I'd say, and yeah. it's statistically, uh, statistically the highest earning period for anyone in the country hmm. is between the age of like forty four and fifty six. Like those uh-huh. are your kind of 
peak earning years. Okay. And that's what we're talking about right now. You're, you're through that early career phase. Um, some of you get out of school a little bit earlier and you, you maybe you'll hit your peak earning in your thirties. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's common in your mid, uh, we, we see people in their late thirties getting to those peak earning years. Yeah. In dentistry that, that, yeah. that happens. Yeah. I mean, these are times when you've, uh, the, the business might be, unless you're still growing, like adding locations, um, you're starting to get to a point where you can see your capacity. You know, you can kind of see the the total capacity of the business and you might be comfortable with where that's at and maybe making some minor changes. But you're, you're starting to see that. You'll have loans that are maybe halfway done. Some could be close to being... Taxes are definitely taxes at its are, maximum point. Yeah, your point. depreciation's gone. Feel, your, right? Yeah, your depreciation's gone. Your amortization's running out. You're not buying big ticket items as frequently anymore as you did in the beginning. Um, so taxes are as high as they're going to be, but so your savings rate should be. So this is a time, you know, when people always want to know, like, what's the balance between, um, saving and paying off debt? We won't go into it in a lot of detail because I, we did that on here. episode 73, 73 back yep. in the day, back in the day in the seventies, uh, 73 episode 73, if you want to check that out. But this is a time when you can start to make those decisions with extra money. So the advice we would give to people is, always maintain a, a healthy savings rate. And you'd want to talk to someone. You can email me, Ryan at dentistadvisors.com. If you want to know what a healthy savings rate is for your income range, there will be a range that will put you either, you know, very comfortable in retirement at a normal age or very comfortable in retirement at an early age. Those, those savings ranges will vary, but this is a time in life when if you can lock that down, let's say your savings goal is 20% of your income. If you can know that it's automated, it's happening, it's going to the most efficient accounts, you're doing some pre-tax, you're building some liquidity, as the business builds on top of that, and let's say you've got 25% left over and you're saving 20, if you want to take 5% and put it towards your debt, you can do that. You can take that 5% and increase your lifestyle, Get the do the traveling you wanted to do, get the boat you wanted to have. Or you, you might say, you know, that extra 5%, my debt's going to go away anyway, I want to just, I want to retire earlier. You know, yeah. I, I want to just speed up my retirement so you can save it. But this is the point in your career where you probably have the cash flow to start making those decisions between I have a save a base savings rate and there's money left over. What should I do with that? Yeah. So what you're saying is there's never a point in someone's career where you'd say, don't save money and build liquidity. Just focus only on debt reduction. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I would never say to anyone, that that's the best plan is just pay off the debt first and then start saving. Unless we're talking about short, really short term spurts of like consumer debt. Let's get rid of some credit cards. Or really short term spurts of really high interest rate student loans. And you're trying to get a few of them. There's nothing we can do about it. Can't consolidate. Um, But I think what we're saying is a more gradual debt reduction plan and a more gradual investment plan. It's not just the, the numbers about comparing what I'm going to earn in my investments to the interest rate on my loans and saying, which one's higher. It's, it's, it's a whole host of factors from giving you experience as an investor that will really help you in your latter years be more mature. Mm -hmm. And it's about taxes and how your taxes will be affected by not having the liquidity to like, I just finished up doing a, for a 39 year old, I mean, we have 39 year olds who are able to put away hundreds, you know, more than a hundred thousand dollars a year away towards retirement, which saves them 40 plus thousand dollars a year in taxes. Mm-hmm. Some cases much more than that. You're talking, uh, uh, that sum of a money, large in a, retirement a, yeah, plan for work, big pension or cash balance. Yeah. Or something. If you, if you're using all of your money to pay down your debt, you have to pay taxes on the money before you can pay down debt with it. It's post tax money. And you miss out on the opportunity to lower your taxes, which, man, I mean, any if there's any tax reduction that you leave on the table uh, at all, you have to keep in mind that's a 40% loss any year that mm-hmm. you let it happen. Yeah. If it's an HSA contribution that you didn't max fund, you lost 40% of your money up in smoke. Yeah. If you didn't buy a, if you didn't depreciate, if you didn't buy a piece of equipment that you needed, and that you just let go and forgot to buy it before the end of the year, you lost 40%. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that if you need them, like the maximizing your retirement plan, your 401k, your 401k match, a profit sharing plan, a SEP IRA, a, yeah. a, a cash balance plan. As you get older in this mid-career phase, you can improve the type of retirement plan you have to put more money away. If, if you even leave any money on the table, 
at, it's a big chunk and of it change, comes man. at the expense of well i had to pay my debt off i'm glad you saved that six percent but it cost you 40 percent by not taking advantage of either the depreciation the deferral the deduction yeah something that you needed yeah or i'd say needed or something that goes into retirement because the retirement money is yours yeah. it'll stay with you yeah now in fairness you don't save 40 percent forever Eventually, you will have to pay taxes on some of this money when you pull it out. So it's not like 40% that's gone forever. You're going to have to reclaim some of it when you yank it out down the road. But your income's at the highest point it's ever going to be, and the likelihood of that being at the same place is Yeah, you know, the likelihood of you still pulling out your same income in retirement for living expenses is not... It's just not very it's just really important to not let debt yeah. reduction come at the expense of not taking advantage of these other. Yeah, things. I would say this is the time of, of career too when not only are, some debts are starting to get paid off just according to their natural amortization schedules, and this is a good time to start uh, considering your debt reduction, your fast debt reduction plan as just using kind of like a snowball approach to some of these debts. You know, you start getting in your late thirties and forties, some debts will be going away Yeah, and grab those payments. If your savings rate's healthy, yeah. grab those payments and throw them to another one. And there's your debt reduction plan. Yeah. And it will say, you know, shave years off your total debt and, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands in interest. Yeah. So it's, it's a good time to start thinking about that stuff. Yep. And, th- and, and to this latter phase of your career, it's a, uh, it's at this point, it has more to do with debts are most likely gone you're going to be having to take have some consideration around renovating your practice, improving the quality of your practice. Thinking about the sale. Thinking about the yeah. sale of your practice and how you want your practice to be positioned in the market. How many new patients you want to be generating before you start having someone appraise it. You know, do you want to invest some money in that? Um, you're also at the point where your retirement plan contributions can be at their peak, and you'll have to give the least amount of money away to uh, staff and team at this point. And so the the ratios are really in your mm-hmm. favor to have maximum liquidity. And uh, t- and so having some debt at this point in your career can also be healthy for you if it's allowing you to defer more yeah. income towards retirement to lower your taxes even more. Um, let's see, every year in your practice, you have a goal of investing, call it you know 2% of your collections back into practice enhancements or mm-hmm. 3%. You might not do it every year, but every third year you might do it. Let's say you're doing a million dollars of collections, you got three percent and thirty thousand a year. That's your yeah. your annual amount, which means every three years you have a hundred grand, or every year you're gonna do thirty. Which you could easily put back into a practice. Yeah, yeah. you could say, okay, years. I build a calendar of things that I know I'm gonna want to do throughout my career, and I'm gonna make sure I stick with that. The question is, is it best to do that with cash, or is it best to do that with um, debt? And every three years, instead of writing that hundred thousand dollar check, you can kind of say, maybe I'll refinance my practice loan from two fifty to three fifty. Yeah. Because you know my my payment will be the same. It, it, I started my loan at three fifty. It's been three years. I've yeah. I've paid it down, and now I'm going to refinance it, add some debt. Yeah. But I'm going to take that hundred thousand and just keep my payment the same. Mm-hmm. That way, I can keep my retirement plan contributions going. I can pay off my house. Yeah. I can take some vacation. And the business gets something it needs. And the business gets its hundred thousand. Because it needs. what you bought three years ago is now old, and yeah. it's not the newest thing anymore. Yeah, and, and and sometimes maybe your interest rates can be lower too at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe there's just better financing options. Yeah. And so, that thinking about your practice in those terms, more more around. How much every year am I going to put back into this to keep my practice competitive and fresh and keep that ROI that we talked about earlier Mm -hmm. at that 18 to 20 plus percent profit instead of 10 or 8 or 5 or 0? It's really essential. Yeah. And I think a good takeaway from this, just a healthy way to view the end of practice is you don't have to um, retire with no debt on your practice. It is okay to sell a healthy, functioning practice that you protected the value and you protected the profitability the whole way and and sell it to the next person with some debt on it and yeah, they don't care debt. it doesn't I matter mean, to them but it shouldn't matter to you either either if yeah. you if you protected your investment then you you made the right decisions on that investment throughout your career yeah what if the, by doing it this way it helped you maintain your practice value at peak value instead of having to sell it at you know 50 percent less than what it was yeah five super, years very ago. common yeah yeah So I think that's just the, that's the trade-off you're making, you know, by, you can't get out of debt easily. It's really hard. I wish it were possible, but you're a business owner. And what's going to happen is if you're patient with it, over time, you'll be able to get rid of all of your debt, have your house completely paid off, 
Along the way, you'll have had more liquidity, so you'll be able to make better decisions as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, and you'll be able to protect the value of your practice and the profitability that it has. And you'll be able to take better vacations, live a better life, like enjoy yeah, yourself. Enjoy it along the way. And uh, rather than having it be a little more volatile and so focused on getting out of debt that it kind of throws off mm -hmm. the the more important decisions, right? Yeah. Well, cool. I think that's a good, uh, good wrap up there. We'll... Um, Invite everyone again. Just in a few weeks, we are the official podcast of the Greater New York Dental Meeting this year. It's happening on, I think, November 26th. Is that true? 26th through the 29th? That's true. Are those are the dates. Yeah. Those are true. 26th Q? through the 29th. That's the weekend after Thanksgiving, the week after. So, gnydm.com. You can register. Come see us. We'll have a booth. Uh, the Dennis Money Show will be doing interviews and, and um, hosting our podcast there. Um, we are on YouTube, so the Dennis Money Show is on YouTube. If you want to check that out, just go and Google it. Find us there. And if you go to our website, dentistadvisors.com, uh, at the top, there's a link to schedule on our calendar. You can find a time that's convenient for you. We'll have a free consultation. We'll chat about your situation, answer any questions we can. And we'd love to hear from you. So thanks for joining us. Carry on. Carry on.